Ginger is the Director of Advancement at Cunningham Children's Home in Urbana, and I'm going to read part of her bio for you. Um, it doesn't do her justice, but we're going to read a little bit of it. Uh, Ginger Mills became Director of Advancement at Cunningham Children's Home in May, May 2019 after serving as Associate Director of Advancement for four years. As Director of Advancement, Ginger oversees the agency marketing, public relations, and annual fundraising initiatives. She believes in Cunningham and the works that's done in the lives of its youth and families to bring healing and hope. One of the aspects Ginger enjoys most about working at Cunningham is developing meaningful and authentic relationships with Cunningham supporters and sharing with them how they continue to help the youth we serve to heal, learn, and grow. Ginger grew up in the United Methodist Church in Iowa and graduated from Simpson College in Indianola with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Studies. She enjoys leading a women's small group, reading, spending time with family, outdoor music concerts, and likes all four seasons, but a sandy beach is her favorite place to be. I completely get that. She and her husband, Mark, who is with us today, live in Savoy and have four adult children. So let's welcome Ginger and your <laughs>
Dennis, you were able to join with me in our opening hymn, Thy Word is a Lamp, which is found on page 601.
Joyce, who was dealing with the situation, for all of the unspoken prayers that hang in our minds and on our hearts. Father, we lift up to you a family just down the street who lost their home in, in a fire this past week. Help us to see where we might be of assistance to them. Father, we lift up to you certainly the war that is ongoing in Ukraine. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray for those on both sides who have lost loved ones. We pray that your will would be done, and that those who do not know you would come to know you and follow your will. Father, we lift up to you certainly on this day, after a night, last night, an opportunity where Many have expressed that they were tired and worn to see joy, to, to be recharged through the voices of the Wanda Mountain boys and saved by grace. How good it is to hear a sermon in every song that we might be lifted up and encouraged for the days ahead. Father, how good it is that both, both of those groups have asked for prayer, that they might continue to share your gospel into the world. And so we lift them up to you this day. As we were encouraged, Father, would you encourage them to continue and for those who waver in doubt, that they might hear them the gifts that you have given to them through voice and be changed. Father, we thank you for and are joyful for all those who have helped to make that an evening that will change lives. Father, we lift up to you certainly Anita moving into a place where she needs to be. And she is joyful and gives you the glory for that. Thank you for all those who stepped up. The Real Men Wear Pink Golf Challenge where we'll raise over $3,500. We lift that up to you that those funds, those lives might be changed, but certainly those funds would go and be used where best they need to be. We thank you for the gift of this fellowship that we have, this community of faith that there are those who love those who are unable to be with us and continue and may it be that we would all step into where Kevin is and learn from him. We thank you for new jobs and new opportunities. We thank you for the break in the weather. We thank you for returning safely to school uh, for Mimi's safe return. We thank you we're being able to get back home again. Father, how good it is. We lift up to you, certainly, those that we were able to see last night for Sterling, and for Mary, that we prayed for regularly. And yet they were in our midst, and we pray that for a moment of time that they do have some joy in their life and that it would extend into their, into their days. We thank you for the opportunity to have been witness to the, the answered prayers that people spoke of. Father, you give us so much, and yet we take so much for granted. Help us each day. Help us each day to return to you, to ask for your assistance for all of the things that will come between us. Help us from making things idols in our lives that distract from you, that take time away from you. For it is in the time that we spend in your presence, when we know the most joy, when we find hope, when we are at peace. And we thank you for all these things. And we pray that in the prayer that 
that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you would stand as you are able and let us sing our God's song with Methodist affiliated schools, Simpson College, one of them, I went there. Um, but 
that no, they even thought, let's, let's think about this a little bit more. And so they prayed about it, and they decided to give the home to the women of the church, which at the time was the women of the Methodist Episcopal Church, because they knew that the women would continue to be future-oriented in keeping up with the changing child welfare needs. So isn't that cool? So Cunningham Children's Home is a mission and ministry of United Women of Faith and the Illinois Great Rivers Conference. We are also a national mission institution of the United Women of Faith. And what that means is that there are about 80 of us um, across the United States. And so we have um, a relationship not just with the women of the IGRC, but the women in New York, which is the global United Methodist Women or United Women. And so it's so cool that in Little Urbana, Illinois, uh, where such good work is doing happening, we are a mission ministry of the United Women of Faith. And even though we're no longer an orphanage like the Cunninghams originally anticipated and envisioned the home would be, um, in fact, on 1895, when Judge Joe gave the home to the women, he wrote in his journal, may God's blessing go with this gift and may it be a means of doing much good. And I believe that the Cunninghams would believe that much good is still happening today. And that is largely because of the United Women in Faith. So I, we need to give a clap to the United Women in Faith. To you all who are sitting in the pews, but if you think about your mothers and your grandmothers and your sisters and your aunts and the women, how long has this church been around? Okay, longer than we've been around. So, I mean, can you imagine the, the women who have helped pave the way? for uh, Cunningham and who we are today. Okay, so next slide. So the women have served alongside of our staff and answered the calls to support funding and in-kind items over the last 127 years. So in the 1920s, we heard stories from the now adult children who remember their moms canning for their family and dividing that amount in half to make sure that the kids at Cunningham had plenty to eat. In the 1940s, when a new dormitory was needed, but all the materials were rationed as a result of World War II, the women petitioned the U.S. government, and they said, no, we need to finish this home. We need to finish this building because kids are going to live here, and they won. And so that's that picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. It says Cunningham Hall, 19, um, 1895 to 1945. But look at the women, they are dressed in their Sunday best, and they are helping take this cornerstone off this little hoist, and they're working to put it in the side of the building, which we still see today. So whenever I walk past, we now call it Admin Hall. But it's just a reminder to me of the women and the work that they did in the 40s. Then we have the picture of the women in the 70s. We are filled with lots of groundbreaking pictures. In that picture, we were raising funds to build a private pool and a recreation center with a multi-purpose gymnasium that housed arts and crafts, game room, lounge, exercise room. And in 2019, the women continued to support Cunningham with a new capital campaign when we opened up the Knoll Education Center, which makes our learning environment for our kids uh, really meet the sensory needs of the youth that we serve today. Quilters, so this last picture here of the quilters, um, they work double time to carry on the 127-year tradition that every child who comes to Cunningham to live gets a quilt for their bed. And that was started by the United Women in Faith over 100 years ago. So not only do the kids feel the, the physical form of the quilt, but they also feel this comfort like, gosh, someone I didn't even know loved and cared for me enough to make a quilt for my bed. Because most kids who come to Cunningham have been to five to seven placements before coming to us. So if you can imagine being a teenager and moving five times, you don't have a lot when you come to Cunningham. And so the quilt is very significant to our kids. So much so that when they leave Cunningham, they get to take one with them. Because the women over the years, and quilters who are not even United Women in Faith, just know that tradition and they want to play a part of it. So it's so cool. Okay, so today Cunningham serves 807 individuals and families. And that is through three main programs. We have a residential treatment center for kids who are referred from, from the Department of Children and Family Services. We have three special education programs. And we have a whole, whole host of community-based services 
including counseling services and a lot of uh, grants that help youth and families who are experiencing difficult life situations. So in our residential program, we work with young people living to overcome the impact of trauma after years of neglect and abuse. In our three school programs, we offer special education for children with autism, mental health issues, and learning disabilities that their own school systems can't provide. So we have two schools on campus. We have our school for our residential kids, but then we have a school that has about 70 kids ranging from kindergarten all the way up to high school, and they are referred from the local school districts. We have probably about 10 different school districts represented in Champaign County. And these kids have worked um, with their teachers and staff in the public education and just realized that Cunningham does a great job with our residential kids. And so they said, these kids just, they live at home, but they come to our day school during the day. Uh, smaller class sizes, a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning with the goal of getting them up to academic grade level and give them some coping mechanisms to help them and then they'll return to their school, school district. And then where we have seen the most growth is really in our community-based programs, where we're working with a whole lot more youth and families in our community. So it's almost like the expertise and the therapies and the trauma-informed approach that we use with our kids in our residential program. We're going now into the community and working with youth and families and making even more of an impact. So, so, so such a great need in our community. So while I think facts and figures can be impressive, today I'm going to actually share stories with you about Cunningham kids and their real life spiritual experiences and how they are linked to eight biblical truths. So my challenge to you is as I share these biblical truths with you, maybe you might jot down the scripture because I want you to think about these biblical truths, maybe hear how they've affected our Cunningham kids, but maybe think about how this scripture or this Bible passage could be used in your own life. Sound good? I want to see a lot of pencils. I want to see a lot of like, note taking going on. Okay, so let's begin. What is a biblical truth? It is a certainty about the nature and character of God. And biblical truths are key takeaways from the Bible. They are those powerful certainties and assurances that make all the difference in living a meaningful, joyful, and purposeful life. A forgiven and free life. And without these truths, we would struggle, we would despair, we would lose hope, and ultimately we would lose our way. So we're going to begin with number one. God's Spirit is with us from the beginning. Genesis 2-7 says, The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Now that biblical truth is that God is in us. Literally, our creator, God's spirit, is a part of us. And a lot of the young people who come to Cunningham have no real knowledge of God. They've never gone to church, they've never prayed or been prayed over, and they've never really been taught about God's great love and mercy. Understandably, because of the abuse and trauma they've experienced, there are some of our kids who don't want to do anything with God, or they might even blame God for some of the circumstances that they have been through. But amazingly, the vast majority of our kids, they do have some sense that there is a God and they long to be connected to God. They are hanging on to a thread of hope that some higher power supreme being who takes care of them and cares about them. They want to believe that they weren't a mistake and that they have value. And I believe that that feeling is deep inside some of them because God put it there when God gave them life. So part of what we do at Cunningham is to tap into that and we help our young people explore and understand spirituality and how it can change their life. Provided by our conference appointment, Chaplain Gay uh, includes worship services, small groups, and individual Bible study groups and counsel for our kids. Now, I know how quickly and how the United Methodist Church moves our pastors around, right? Guess how long Chaplain Gay has been at Cunningham? She's our ordained United Methodist pastor. 15 years which is awesome because I just think about the hundreds of kids and families that she's been able to make an impact 
over the last 15 years. So she shares this one story. She said, one day, Scott, a teenage boy, living at Cunningham, was seen running across our campus. He was running straight towards her as she was getting out of her car. As soon as he reached her, Scott caught his breath and he cried out, I do believe in God. Just the day before, Scott had told her emphatically, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But something had changed just the night before. Something he had heard or learned at Cunningham had reached that deep, dark place in his heart. So that morning, he greeted her with a new declaration. And he said, I do believe in God. What's next? Can I get a Bible? There is a longing inside of us. This calling to us that we, that we didn't put there, it comes from God. So number two is the Spirit of God moves in mind-boggling ways. And this is John 3, 8. Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So God's Spirit moves at places and times when we least expect it. And I can tell you that God's Spirit is working overtime at Cunningham. Time and time again, His Spirit breaks through. One day after chapel service, Andre said, I felt something during that last song. It was like a chill, but I wasn't cold. And it felt good, and it made me want to talk about my feelings. And I don't usually do that. For the next 30 minutes, his thoughts and feelings poured out of him. He circled back to that feeling he had gotten, and he said, what was that? Chaplain Gay said, that was God's spirit. And Andre said, oh, I get it. God was trying to show me that talking about things that bother me better than keeping my thoughts to myself when they become negative. Just like everywhere else at Cunningham, God's spirit moves in mysterious, unpredictable, and mind-boggling ways. So number three is God hears and answers. Luke 11, 19. Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now, as I already talked about, the youth at Cunningham come to us because they have experienced abuse, trauma, and neglect. They've been removed from their parents' care. But through counseling, trauma-informed practices, helping kids develop, develop coping mechanisms, we work with them to overcome their trauma and leave Cunningham and lead independent, success, successful lives. But one evening, Janice refused to go into her room. And she said that she could see the face of the abuser in her window. Others couldn't see him, but she could. Finally, the chaplain gave, Janice went back into her room. And they placed their hands on the window and they prayed several times. God, remove the evil from this place and only let your spirit in. God, remove the evil from this place and only let your spirit in. Janice she slept well that night, and that night, and from then on after, and when that face would appear, she knew what to do. God, remove the evil from this place. She would touch that place where it appeared, and she would pray that over and over and over, and it would go away, and she could have a good night's sleep. One day, some of our kids were talking about David and Goliath and the giants that we sometimes face in our own lives. And Bradley said, I'll tell you what my giant was. I was in the juvenile detention center. I was facing being locked up for several years because of what I had done. The day before I was to go to court, I prayed all day and all night and I didn't eat. I just prayed for God's mercy. And the next day, the charges were dropped and I came to Cunningham instead. God took down my giant. On Easter Sunday, Chaplain Gay has our young people write messages to God. They tie the notes to helium balloons and they're released into the, check, into the sky after the Easter uh, morning worship. Six months after Easter, Carol came to chapel and said, at Easter, I wrote to God saying that I wanted to have visits with my mom. And now, six months later, that's happening. God answered my prayer. Biblical truth number four, there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new creation. 
The old is gone, a new life has begun. Now, a group of our youth were watching a video called Chisel, performed by the skit guys. In the skit, one guy asks God to change his life, and the other guy, playing God, comes with a chisel and starts to chip away all the various things in this man's life that doesn't belong. Things that are keeping him from being the person that God created him to be. After the video, one of our boys named Mickey said, I'm just like that guy. I have so many things wrong with me. I've done so many things wrong. Listening, Chaplain Gay responded by introducing Mickey to a Bible verse that has become a favorite for him. Anyone who belongs to Christ is, is, is a new creation. Another young man, Sheldon, shared something that he wrote in his journal. On Thursday, October 9th, at 6 a.m. in my room alone, I invited Jesus into my life. I know I am a broken person, and he is the only one who can truly fix me. Even though I have turned my back numerous times on God, God never turned his back on me. I know I am forgiven, and with God on my side, I will learn to make better choices for my life. So there is nothing, no past, so bad, so bad that God cannot forgive. Okay, I just looked at my watch. It's 11 o'clock. Dewey, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I am only on number five. Am I allowed to continue to go on for the three more biblical truths? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Three more? Okay, I'm going to talk really fast, I guess. Okay, number five. God gives us hope and strength in time of trouble. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid, for you are with me. So we have a new ministry at Cunningham that we started about a year and a half ago. It is called Caminos, C-A-M-I-N-O-S. It is Spanish, and it means safe journey or safe walk or safe path. And so in our alignment to see every child thrive, we have started providing short-term residential and educational services to youth coming from the border. And they're walking from their home countries, normally countries like Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and they are escaping severe poverty, gang recruitment, gang violence, witnessing death, human trafficking. And when we started talking about this three years ago, we came to the board, which we are a 31 member board. 18 of them are United Women in Faith, including Sharon, including Anita Ashcroft, who used to be on the committee. Ellen Dixon has been on our board. There's probably other women in this church, maybe some of you have served on our boarding committees in the past. But when we came to the board and we said, what do we do about this? We are being approached to provide these short-term services to these kids. The women said, it meets your mission, it meets our mission for social justice and caring for kids. And so we said, yep, let's do it. We don't make it a political issue at all, we make it a human services issue. And so what happens is that these kids come to the border, if you are under 18 without a parent or guardian, the United States actually lets you welcomely come in through this act called the Flores Act. And so then they're processed at the border, they're flown up to Chicago, and they're driven down to Urbana, Illinois. No rhyme or reason on who, who we have or who comes to us, but we know that these are kids who have experienced trauma just like our state of Illinois kids, and we know that we can do a really good job in providing short-term residential and educational services. Now these kids come to us with family information, like they already have a family member somewhere living in the United States. And so we continue to provide services to them. They live with us on our campus, separate from our Illinois kids. And while we're doing this, we're working with the Office of Refugee Resettlement to vet that family member, to make sure that they are a safe placement, they are who they say they are, and then we help to reunite them, which is so cool because that is our vision, to see every child thrive, to see the families flourish. And so to be a part of that family reunification, 140 kids reunified with their family, it's really an awesome feeling. And so, sorry, I just went off script a little bit, but here we go, back on. At one worship gathering, because Chaplain Gay works with these kids as well, a lot of them very, very religious. A lot of them are Catholic. And so we work with priests in our community to help with communion and help honor 
traditions that these kids honor and have in their own country spiritual traditions. But they were talking about the 23rd Psalm, and they discussed how the Good Shepherd leads and guides us. And I can sh I'm sure you can guess the response when asked, what is the most helpful verse to you from this psalm? And they said, he is our shepherd. He takes care of us. Jesus got us through the valley when we traveled to get here. Another woman in our care has a mother who suffers from severe mental illness. And even so, her mother has been able to keep custody of four of her five children. But she had no interest in her oldest daughter, is a young woman on Paul Lilly. Lily has no hope of returning home. Before Cunning to Cunningham, Lily felt rejected and hopeless that she turned to a gang for acceptance. One day, when in a Bible study at Cunningham, the group read Psalm 27, in which verse 10 says, Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. And Lily smiled, and she pointed up, and she said, He's my only hope. God gives us strength and hope in times of trouble. Okay, number six, God has a plan for each one of us. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for us. Melanie came to a spiritual discussion group. Before the group got started, she was irritable, saying she was just tired of everything, and she felt like giving up. And the group opened with Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. When Melanie heard the verse, she shouted out, well, that is the third time I've heard that verse this week. She asked, well, what do you think is the reason for that? You know, still kind of irritable. But then, after thinking about it for a little bit, she said, ah, I get it. God does not want me to give up. During Vacation Bible School, some of our youth were sitting inside a huge plastic tarp. It's a whale. And what story do you think Chaplain Gay was talking about? Jonah, yes. And a young woman said, that story is telling me that God placed me at Cunningham to give me another chance. Here I'm learning how to live my life the right way. Cunningham is like a stepping stone to adulthood. Now the youth at Cunningham love learning the meaning of Christmas, including the story of Jesus' birth. One time just before our Christmas program was to get underway. But the boy who was supposed to play the part of the innkeeper, he panicked and he bailed. So another boy named Trey was asked if he would be willing to step in at the last minute and play the role of the innkeeper. And Trey's face lit up, and he proudly proclaimed, you mean I get to be the person who helps Jesus? Yes! As she prepared to leave Cunningham, Megan shared with this with her peers. When I first came here, I had no idea who I was. I thought I was alone. I thought nobody cared. But now I know that I am a child of God, I am a survivor of depression, and I am no longer self-harming. Recently, Megan came back for a visit. She's now in college, she wants to become a vet tech, and she's teaching Sunday school. See, God has a plan for each one of us. Number seven, God's love is the greatest gift of all. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. After exploring faith and learning of God's unconditional love, Emma asked to be baptized. Before coming to Cunningham, she had been abused in every way for years. She had felt dirty. After her baptism, she came out of our swimming pool and she smiled at those, her staff, the Chaplain Gay, who had gathered around her for that important transitional moment and she said, thank you for this opportunity to be cleansed in Jesus' love. Now, before I got here this morning, I'm handing out bulletin inserts, even though you don't have bulletins, that's okay. But there's a story, more about Evan's baptism, on the back side of that insert. And there's, if, you, if you didn't catch one when you walked in, there's still some on the back table. A young man named Owen recently transitioned from our agency to another placement. And he was with us, okay, for nine years. I think I told you the average length of stay was five to seven, nine years. In fact, I, I have been with Cunningham eight years, so I had kind of seen him grow up. And uh, a few years ago, when the chaplain, when Chapel Gay commented on how she had seen him maturing, handling his anger and managing his behaviors in more positive ways, he nodded and he just kind of said, yeah, a little bit of Jesus makes a big difference. Oh, no, 
over the last several years, you know, Owen actually explored, explored dozens of different religions. He was always kind of an inquisitive kid, so Gay would always try to respond to those questions or match him up with people who, had, who, who were not Christians, but we still wanted him to explore all these different kinds of faith. But two weeks before he was to leave, he said, you know what, I'm going to be baptized as a Christian. I've tried every religion. Christianity is the only one that works for me. So Owen was baptized, just like Emma was. It was the day before he left. We watched. You know, Emma wanted to be dumped in the pool. Owen just like, no, just give me the sprinkle. But it was so great to see this amazing transformation of Owen. Okay, last one, number eight. We cannot do this alone. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toll. Now, God's love shines through in how the United Women in Faith support and love our kids. The quilts made by them from every corner of the Illinois Great Rivers Conference are a wonderful example of helping our kids. They are beautiful and a constant reminder to our kids that they are loved at Cunningham. Uh, their, God's love is demonstrated through the hope gifts that you're talking about for your fall and spring meeting, the fall meeting coming up. The Christmas gifts, the prayers, serving on our boarding committees, all of these are ways that God's love is shown through the women. If you want to show your love, I'd ask for you to prayerfully consider. There are prayer requests in the blue box, and those are specific requests that our kids have. You can continue to pray for our kids. If you'd like to give a gift, you certainly can. Uh, the, what we receive from the state of Illinois is down here. The cost of care is up here. There's this difference, and the United Women of Faith help us bridge that gap. It's about $37 a day per kid. And so if you prayerfully want to make a gift, you would be helping the mission at Cunningham to see every child thrive. If you would stand as you were able, and we will sing our final hymn. Be thou my vision. Yes. A 451 in the Pew Bible. Thank you. 